This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1035, recorded on August 11th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi there, Vincent. Uh, what do we got here? We got uh, another another cloudless day. I could use some clouds. Uh, and it's about 102 out. Uh, and it's been that way for weeks. And it's going to be that way for at least another couple of weeks. I think through through August. Uh, there had, hadn't rained in weeks. There you go. 29 and sunny here in New York City. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's uh, 27C, 80 Fahrenheit. Lovely, lovely day with some puffy clouds coming through after a blast of thunderstorms blew through last night, which seems to be like every few days we get another frontal system blasting through. But no damage here, so all good. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's 83 Fahrenheit here, 28 Celsius. Uh, nice sunny day. Um, not quite as humid as it has been, so I'll take it. You guys, amazing. <laughs> yeah, Rich, it's like you live in a desert or something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Texas. It's hot. It's yep. Texas. It's hot. Okay, we have one announcement, just reminding everyone there is a second position available in Amy Rosenfeld's lab at the FDA. That is the Food and Drug Administration. There's a part of it called CBER, Center for what? <laughs> Biologics Evaluation and Research. Ooh, Thank you. Biologics. Nice. Holy cow. Biologics. And this is for a research There's assistant. There's also seed, CDER. Can you guess what that is? Yeah, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, yeah, right? There you go. Yeah, that's across the way. Yep. Right, yeah. And I forget what the abbreviation is for the devices branch because I don't really. Oh, there's a devices there's, branch too? Yeah, there's devices. Huh. All right. Well, uh, well, D's already taken. D's already taken. Yeah, I forget what they did for that. And there is a, a research assistant position available where you can work on enteroviruses and uh, immune responses and animal models. So we will put a link in the show notes. You can read more about the position. And uh, there is a email where you can email Dr. Rosenfeld and get more information about that position. All right. So we have a snippet in a paper for you today on this August Friday which means the month August. I guess for some people it's August, right? <laughs> well, we're August because we're doing TWIV. Yes. That could be better. Exactly. For August commentators. And this one is in Science Advances. What is that, like an open access thing of science, yes. Alan? Yes. Yeah, so that's science um, capitalizing on the open access trend. Hey, everybody else capitalizes. Every, everybody else is getting page fees. We might as well, too, is what they said, and yeah. or words to that effect. This one is an interesting analysis of vaccination trends. It's called Quantifying the Impact of SARS-CoV-2 Temporal Vaccination Trends and Disparities on Disease Control. We have Sophie Larson, Shin, Joseph, West, Anorga, Mina, Mahmoud, and Martinez. And they are from the University of uh, Illinois uh, and the University of Oxford and the University of California. Yep. Two Illinois campuses, Urbana-Champaign and Chicago. Right. If anybody's keeping track. And there's no champagne in Urbana-Champaign. There, there probably is. There probably is. Yeah, it's spelled differently, right? Right. Yeah. So as uh, this is an interesting uh, introduction. They say uh, over 6.9 million deaths worldwide. And you will see we have a letter. I don't know if we'll get to it today where someone says, no, no, over, I don't know. 20 million. 20 million because the 6.9 is the, you know, recorded, reported yeah. deaths. And then if you do all kinds of statistics, you can get more deaths. 
right? We, and you got, if you do all kinds of statistics, you can get more deaths. I think That's some all. of my students talk about that in their statistics class. Yeah. Um, but I think you mean things like uh, excess deaths. Excess yeah. deaths. Yeah, there well, was a, we deaths, did a paper deaths that were not right. counted, right. that were not counted in the official statistics. Right. Yeah. You can figure out when, when, where they happened and, and what's going on by looking at overall demographics and, and other measures. Right. And so, um, that's what I meant. And there's some statistics involved in excess mortality. So yes. but this paper is mostly statistics as well. Yes, it's, it's about becoming a statistic. Yeah. So, um, but I just want to say the person who yelled at us, uh, and yell, by yelling, if you put an exclamation point, I consider that yelling. It's not a bad thing, but it's just the different tone. And if you capitalize every word, then and you're screaming at us, I guess. <laughs> There's so many ways to have an impact. Um, this is where we get those numbers that just the reported death. Anyway, uh, there have been disparities in outcomes, as you know, which have been uh, various reasons, socio-demographic groups, racial and, and socioeconomic disparities, in, uh, and in f infection fatality rates, all-cause mortality, testing rates, social distancing. Many people can't social distance. They have to go to work and so forth. Uh, and so um, that's what this paper addresses at the level of vaccination. So, so far at the, uh, at the time this paper was written, 13.4 billion vaccine doses have been given as of June 2023. Uh, exceeding the global population. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Uh, but they note there has been unequal distribution of the vaccine supply between high-income countries and low- and middle-income uh, countries. And those vaccine doses, they their numbers are that it's uh, estimated to have averted at least 14 million deaths, uh, a number which I suspect is actually also a bit low. Yes, certainly. I'd like to have that kind of numbers at the tip of your tongue because people say, oh, sure. the vaccines didn't do anything. Yeah. Or COVID was nothing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the, it's the classic problem with vaccines. You know, if the people whose lives were saved by vaccines knew who they were, there would be no anti-vaccine movement. You just yeah, couldn't exactly. get that off the ground. <laughs> So this paper attempts to look at these disparities. They say the scale, the persistence, and impact of SES, socioeconomic, socioeconomic status, status, vaccination disparities. They, they looked at publicly available uh, spatiotemporal, which means where and when, yes. <laughs> vaccination data, where in the world and at what time the vaccines were given. And then they use statistical models uh, to find out the effect of uh, socioeconomic status and uh, other things on on incidence and mortality. It's a very interesting outcome. You, maybe you'd be a little surprised at it. So they have a wonderful figure 1A, which looks at vaccination and gross domestic product per capita for 160 countries and territories. It is a straight line, almost from the origin to the right, when you plot GDP per capita on the x-axis and the, the population with at least one dose, the companies with less GDP have less percent doses. And then as the GDP goes up, so on the upper right, we have the U.S., we have Norway, we have Israel, China, and then all the way down. Well, I see Haiti. That's the one that's way yeah. down there, right? So it's yeah, just— Yeah, so there, there are some outliers on this. It does—it tracks roughly to a line— but then you've got some countries that either did overperformed or underperformed. And actually, China is well above the line, Ecuador way above the line, and Nicaragua is kicking everybody's butt yeah. on you know vaccination per GDP. I don't know exactly what the situation was there, but so that you know, Nicaragua is way up job. because with the GDP per capita of about eight, which is not near eleven like the U.S. and Norway, with eight they got right. almost a hundred percent of the population with at least one dose. Yeah. But basically what you see here is that there's an association between GDP per capita and percent of the population that is vaccinated. So in general, the more money, the more likely you were to The richer be. the country, the more likely they are to have vaccinated their population. Yeah. And they also do interesting color coding um, to indicate the continents. And so you can also see some interesting patterns by continent here. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, that's, I guess, not surprising, right? right? No, that's that's pretty much, that's been documented elsewhere, but not as thoroughly probably as in, yeah. as in this, because they yeah. really collected a lot of data for this paper. Okay, so here's some more interesting data. They, they further looked at this disparity. So this is a disparity, right, between all these countries, yeah. right? They wanted to use two metrics, uh, the ratio and the difference, for the average, the maximum, and the percentage of the population vaccinated at the final week that they looked at. And so these are six different metrics, basically. They found that California, Florida, Colombia, Malaysia, and Israel are, have the highest disparity. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. So, so the, they're the, the looking- range, right? There's a range yeah. of getting- mm -hmm. So they're looking at a few different, a couple of dis different disparities here. There's the economic disparity, which they measure with an index called the Gini index. Um, and that is- um, But not yet, yeah, that's coming next. Yeah, okay, so right? so that's where that's where we see this- but here first, they're just looking at gross Big disparities. Effect. Oh, gross, you know, right. The in average, the maximum, coverage, and minimum right. of the population yes. vaccinated. And in other words, when there's a disparity, there's a big range, basically. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. yes. So California and Florida have a lot of people that are vaccinated and a lot of people that are not vaccinated. Yes. Right? And, uh, and they, those countries also have disparities. So the U.S. is not surprising, right? States are <laughs> disparities in Florida in particular. I'm kind of surprised at California. Yeah, I think there's probably different reasons for mm -hmm. Florida and California. Yes. Um, but uh, I, I was surprised at Israel, right? Um, I thought they did a pretty even job vaccinating. But some of the least disparities were found in Argentina, uh, a part of Brazil, um, Amapa, and the Republic of Korea and Finland. So they were pretty homogeneous in their ability to get um, vaccines throughout the population, despite SES. Um, they also found places with disparities that favor low over high socioeconomic groups. Is, so the, the lower groups are getting more vaccine than the high SES groups. And this is the Amazonas and Nevada. Yeah. So you can imagine maybe there are state programs. State programs that did a very good yes. job vaccinating poor people. And when you go to the to the U.S. states and look through, you see there there are. It's not just Nevada. I noticed Massachusetts actually did a little better. The the um, the upper and lower curves track almost exactly, and then the the lower socioeconomic status actually does a little better. Mm. Um, and then a lot of them track exactly, and then the majority of them, it's the the poorer you are within the country, the less likely it is you will have been vaccinated at the end. Right. Okay, now you want to talk about genies? Yeah, so <laughs> this is um, this comes up a lot in uh, in development um, and in in any sociologically oriented study. Um, it's a way of quantifying income inequality in a country. Mm. So you can I, the Wikipedia page on it is actually quite good if you want to uh, look at it. Uh, the Gini coefficient measures um, how much of the wealth is controlled by what percentage of the population. Okay. So the fewer people you have holding more of the wealth, the higher your Gini index is. Um, and so you can you can look at the Gini index for different countries and find there are obviously differences in these, and you can then compare those to the vaccination inequality mm -hmm. and see if the disparity in um, wealth distribution correlates with disparity in vaccine distribution. Right. And it does. Gini coefficients of disparity are statistically significant in association with the Gini index of income inequality. So they, they conclude from that that socioeconomic inequality is a likely driver of vaccine inequity, right? Yes. Okay. Also not surprising, but this is, I think, the best data that have been collected yeah. that really show no, that. I mean, you need to, you need to formalize it because yeah. if, right. if you don't, people will say, well, how do you know? <laughs> right. Well, and, and it's also important because we can see some of those outliers, like we talked about, where we don't see that relationship. And someone right. might then look at those places and say, okay, what are they doing differently? Yeah. And how can we think about what they're doing differently to change what we see? Right. 
Now, the next part is very interesting. They start by saying this, and this is, I laughed aloud, inspired by a method traditionally used in ecology, enzyme kinetics, and life expectancy. <laughs> you would never think that a method would be used in all those, of those things. things. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so, well, thermodynamics in the stock market, yeah, so that's why right. not? Uh, so they, they fit a functional response to the percentage of the population vaccinated over time, and they get three parameters. The maximum percentage of the population vaccinated, the week at which half of the vaccination potential is reached, and a standard parameter that relates to the shape of these, of these trends. All right. And so um, they have two distinct kind of vaccine rollouts. One uh, is a very fast initial rollout. Um, and then there is a, that they call that a, uh, um, a concave, I think. Yeah, right? which was confusing type. to me because it looks convex to me. It's convex, right? Because so the, <laughs> the curve that um, you see the vaccination, quickly, right? yeah, it goes up very yeah. quickly and then plateaus. Yeah. And, um, and they say that's like in Cape Verde, whereas in Malaysia, you have a sigmoidal trend where you take a long time to get going, right? Yeah. I, I think I have probably looked at or thought about this most recently when thinking about enzyme kinetics. Yes. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine those enzyme kinetic curves yeah, uh, yeah. for anyone who isn't looking at the paper of just sort of getting to the max quickly and staying stably at that max or the traditional S-shape curve. Right. All right. So again, a, a rapid initial rollout, then slowing down, that's concave, slow beginning, some delay, and then uh, reaching it eventually, which is a sigmoidal. sigmoidal. Uh, and they do a number of analyses of this, and they've realized that the well, even though the overall vaccine coverage, as we just said, is based on so socioeconomic uh, inequality, the initial speed and shape of this trend, whether it's convex or sigmoidal, is independent of socioeconomic inequality. Yeah. So you could be a rich country and end up with a sigmoidal curve, or you could be a poor country and end up with a concave curve or vice versa. Yeah. Um, it because, track. you know, a poor country may not have a lot of vaccine, but maybe they're really good at getting it to people. And that gives you that uh, convex curve, right? Right. You reach the the fraction of people that you can give with what you have, but you do it quickly. Yeah. And I think this is maybe more unexpected and a big reason why it's important to do this. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And you can imagine a whole bunch of possible reasons for that. I mean, it could be logistical. Um, country that's geographically small, easy to distribute, geographically large, harder. Um, or it could be some other, you know, management related thing, maybe just the way they chose to deploy the vaccine. So that's stuff yeah, that's yeah. worth drilling into. Okay, so now given these data, they can they calculate an average daily vaccination rate, all right? And then they say, what's the what would be the theoretical impact of that on infection? So they they use what what's called a SEIR, susceptible exposed infectious removed model. You have susceptible people, you have exposed people, you have people who are shedding, and then people who are removed, uh, they're they've been infected and have recovered. All right, and that these is or a, th they've been infected and died and one way or, or another. Yes. They're not getting yes. infected again right away. So these this is a classic way of of uh, analyzing uh, infection dynamics in a population. And they say, what would be the effect of uh, average daily vaccination rate? What they find is that if you have a rapid rise in vaccination rate, the convex curve, there's a larger impact on infection. Uh, than if you have the sigmoidal curve, if you start later, so if you ramp up slowly. So the concave strategy is optimal. It's, a, it's very interesting. So it doesn't matter that it tapers off. It's better than the sigmoidal one. I, I guess it's intuitive because very early on, you're making people immune and that impacts subsequent transmission to others. Whereas if you take a long time to get going, you still have a lot of susceptible people early on, right? Yeah, you sort of stop case numbers early because you've done vaccination early. And uh, remember, the, the vaccines were not available for months into the pandemic. And so uh, they said, you know, once those vaccines are available, if you do a fast rollout, you have uh, less incidence and less mortality. Um, 
and they they, they do uh, they they further look at these concave and sigmoidal strategies um, using f- four different scenarios of disparities and a no vaccination scenario. So we're going to again look at infection and in, uh, by the Sears model. So one, the average parameters for each socioeconomic group. Two, an extreme case of disparity, so really big disparity. One person has all the money is basically the, <laughs> the model of extreme disparity they use. Gini index of one. Three, the average parameters uh, re- disregarding socioeconomic groups. And four, having the low SES group vaccinated at the same rate as the high SES group. So that's the best case scenario. Uh, they found a, a, a good amount of deaths could be averted when compared to a no vaccination case by moving the worst case disparity to any of those other st- scenarios, right? So worst case, everybody has, the, one person has the money, right? <laughs> that was the worst yeah. case. So if you move from Best that- case is everybody has exactly the same amount of money, I think. Right. So. But moving away from that is is always good, right? Right. Plus, again, a faster initial rollout is rollout is always better in all of these scenarios, except the one where there's no vaccine, of course, and there's no... There's then no then there's nothing to roll out. There's yeah. nothing to roll out. <laughs> uh, so 20 to 25 to 27% of deaths averted, an additional 25 to 27% of deaths averted when moving from a sigmoidal to a concave type. So that's the number, that's how much better it is. So both the temporal trend and the disparity can have an impact uh, on the outcomes. And so they did a, a another modeling experiment where they vary the halfway week of vaccination for the high SES from five to 30 weeks, maximum potential vaccinated from 50 to 100%. And they find that no matter what type of curve, concave or sigmoidal, having a higher potential of people vaccinated is always better for both deaths. Well, that makes sense, right? Um, but the halfway week, the point where you get half the population immunized, has a much stronger effect on the outcomes than the maximum vaccinated. So again, the faster you do it is better than getting the whole population. If you immunize the whole population two years later, not going to have as much of an impact as if you got 25% of the population immunized way at the beginning of the pandemic. Yay, public health infrastructure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So they say the further modeling, the majority of places with concave dynamics would get uh, lead to 60 to 90 percent of deaths averted compared to 40 to 70 percent of deaths averted in the case of sigmoidal trends, in, 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 independent of socioeconomic status. And uh, so they actually did some more modeling to understand the impact of socioeconomic disparity. Um, it's minimal. The differences are minimal under a fast rollout and full coverage. Six or seven percent difference um, based on SES. So um, it's very interesting that they say this fast rollout in the early weeks of vaccination drives a higher percentage of cases averted. That's the bottom line here. Yeah. And that that on its own is independent uh, of socioeconomic status. Now, the overall vaccination is dependent on status, the percentage of your country. But it if you get it, what you have out there faster, it can make up for not having as much vaccine, right? And this is great news because um, economic disparity is something that's going to take a long time and a lot of work to fix. Um, yes. Whereas vaccine rollout rate is something that we can fix. This is something that that is procedural and could potentially be implemented widely knowing this and the next pandemic. All right. You know, you got to roll the vaccine out quickly as fast as possible, however much you have. And that's going to save lives. Yeah. I think that that's one thing that is really nice about this paper is it sort of gives you an obvious action. Yeah. Yeah, Modifying the distribution and timing for all groups can effectively counterbalance the negative effects of vaccine inequity. And this is also uh, interesting. When it comes to reducing mortality, the timing plays a more substantial role than overall coverage, indicating that stockpiling vaccines can actually be detrimental to the entire population, which was previously highlighted within the framework of vaccine nationalism, which we we had uh, 
some people on a while ago to talk about that, if you remember, um, the, the effect of, of, of some countries hoarding a lot of the vaccine. So you shouldn't stockpile. Unless there's no pandemic, so, you know. Well, right. You have some on hand for... Yeah, we stockpile H5N1 case. vaccine. We stockpile... Yes, uh, smallpox, smallpox vaccine. Smallpox vaccine, yeah. yeah. Uh, so interestingly, I'm thinking here, maybe, you, maybe you've already uh, said this or alluded to it. Uh, if you expand this principle globally, then the idea is that if you get global uptake of vaccine as soon as possible, everybody benefits. Yes, right. Yes. That's that right. makes sense. Exactly right. Yes, so reducing the international disparity yeah, exactly. would definitely have a big impact. Yeah. That is something else that's going to be hard to implement, but mm -hmm. the factual basis is there at least. But this is certainly evidence in favor of doing so. Yeah, so, that's yeah. what yeah. I mean. This, sort of this really makes the case. A corollary of that in a way is that, you know, hoarding vaccine doesn't buy you anything. Uh, right. Uh, not necessarily. Okay. That in fact, there is a benefit to you for uh, helping helping others out. Yeah. To get the distribution as broad as possible, as quick as possible. Or put more starkly, hoarding vaccine kills. Yeah. Good title. Um, so what do you if you're a pharma company and then the US and Europe and whatever come and they, they want to buy all your vaccine up, you want to sell it to them because you want to sell your vaccine, right? But that's not the right thing to do. You should take some and give it to countries who, who can make an impact by um, vaccinating quickly, right? I don't think it works if we put that decision in the hands of the companies. No. No, currently it is though, right? Yes. And um, I think WHO would like to try and change that or influence yes. it, right? <laughs> yes. But I Some mean- Some kind of international agreement that we won't buy up more vaccine than we need. Yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. But did you know, the a lot of countries that, can't afford the vaccine initially. They have to wait for, say, uh, grants from other countries. That makes the delay, and that's where you get the mortality, right? Because we're not getting yep. it out there as quickly as possible. And in my opinion, I don't think this is a universally shared sentiment, although it probably is here on this podcast. In my opinion, everyone's life is worth saving. Sure. Not, not just people yeah. with a lot of money. Yeah. And if you have a lot of money and you're listening and you're going to stop listening because I said that, don't you? <laughs> don't worry about bye what bye. I... Just, you want to learn, so stay, okay? But that's yeah. how I feel. I think a life is amazing. Mitochondria are amazing, you know? Everybody has <laughs> mitochondria. Um, so we should save all lives. Um, but that's not the, the overall view, unfortunately. So that, that's a cool paper. I thought it was nice... Uh, Interesting, unexpected conclusion. Thank you, folks, for yeah, doing this. Yeah, very cool. When you have a lot of data, you can do good things with it. And when you have a small amount of data, uh, don't think statistics are going to make it good. <laughs> <laughs> right? If you have just, you know, a few... Uh, Extrapolating from a single point is never going to work. What did, oh, Paul Offa called it the tyranny of small numbers. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because we were talking about uh, the there's this new monoclonal for um, RSV, which you can give prophylactically to babies, right? And it lasts three months, so it will last the respiratory syncytial virus season. But in the clinical trial, uh, they had three infants die, right? And they were all in the treatment group, which you would say, oh, that's pretty weird. But then you first thing you would say is they, they happened 140 days after administration of the monoclonal. So probably it was not related. And then it turns out the three of them had uh, d diseases that were undetected on enrollment. So that's why they died. Yeah, that's after the 120 tw or the, the three months. Yeah. <laughs> but he said, though. I said, in the end, some parents going to look and say, but they're all in the treatment group, you know, and ignore what you've just said. And he said, yeah, that's the problem with small day, small numbers, the tyranny of small numbers, because yep. uh, you can't, you know, it was not a huge, it was not a 40,000 baby clinical trial, right? 
And so that's what you're stuck with. All right. Onwards. Now we have a, a pox virus paper. And so for the first time in many years, I think, uh, Rich is going to do this. Right, Rich? Yep. I'm going to try anyway. I may need a little help from my friends. <laughs> well, yeah, we got here Brian for here for the sensing. Good. And we all know about protein synthesis, right? Yep. I think what's cool so, about this is it, it's, we're back to tRNAs, which everyone yeah. thinks is boring. Oh, no. <laughs> tRNAs are at the center of things. So this paper is titled, Human SAMD9 is a pox virus activatable anti-codon nuclease inhibiting codon-specific protein synthesis. So that's it. Another twiv is That's viral. a lot to unpack, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, all of that will make sense. But after, Rich, what is uh, what is if we're successful? What, what is codon specific protein synthesis? Isn't all protein synthesis codon driven? Um, right. There's a if you inhibit it, I think, it I only... think this is more like inhibits protein synthesis in a codon specific fashion. How I about see. That? Yes. Okay. Okay. So it inhibits a particular codon. In protein synthesis. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's not broadly hitting all amino acids. Right. It's hitting one hitting particular one. one. Okay. So the, the necessity to make a short title kind of made it yeah. unclear. Okay. So yeah. uh, this comes from um, people at uh, uh, University of Texas Southwest, uh, Southwestern in San Antonio uh, and from Cornell University in Ithaca and from uh, Oklahoma State University. There are two senior authors, Xu Bing Quan uh, from uh, Cornell and Yan Zhang from uh, UT Southwestern in San Antonio. Uh, there's a rough. There's two authors from Oklahoma, and then there's four uh, four other authors, each from uh, San Antonio and from um, Cornell. And I want to, you know, my guess is this is a massive piece of work, and it's just uh, it's a tour de force. So I want to read these names so uh, so that people get appropriate credit, and I'll butcher them all. You can help me out if you want. Uh, first author is Fu Shun Zhang, and then we have Quan Quan Ji, Juhi Chaturvedi, uh, Maricel Morales, uh, Huan Hui Mao, uh, Zhang Ji Meng, Li Ming Dong, Junpeng Deng, and then our two senior authors, Xu Bing Quan and... Uh, Yan Zhang. I think the Q U is uh, Q I is Shan. Oh, Shan, okay, Shan. I think, yeah. Okay, good. And actually, you know, this is a almost a shockingly short author list for the amount of work in oh, this yeah. paper. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. My <laughs> guess is all of these people contributed a significant amount. A lot. Yeah. So um, I want to I want to give a significant introduction to this, including uh, giving the bottom line first, uh, so try and make it easier to follow. So the high level view is a, a a theme that we've talked about many times before, which is that, as you might imagine, if you give it any thought, um, cells and organisms don't would prefer not to be infected by and <laughs> killed by viruses. Right. And so over evolutionary time, uh, they have developed uh, mechanisms for fighting off virus infections. And uh, this in a multicellular organism, this can happen at the cellular level. So we have intracellular pathways uh, that uh, prevent or try to prevent virus infection. And then we have uh, more systemic pathways, for example, the whole immune response or uh, the um, uh, adaptive immune response. Uh, for uh, fighting off virus infection. But uh, viruses aren't stupid either. And so they're um, engaged in this conflict. And many viruses have developed numerous countermeasures to fight off these uh, restrictions, both intracellular and extracellular. And I have to say that pox viruses are... Uh, I don't know if they're the champions, but man, they're right up there towards the top at this um, uh, counter uh, countermeasures, immune uh, restriction countermeasures thing. Pox viruses, uh, of which uh, smallpox is the most notorious, and I won't go through the whole pox thing other than to say that they are uh, large double-stranded DNA-containing viruses. 
uh, are really very good at this virus countermeasures things. We're and the about- large part of that description is a big part of that. Yep, they can exactly. carry yeah. yes. all this exactly. excess baggage into the right. cell to turn off all the different cell stuff that's right. going to try and respond to them. We're talking about a, a genome that has roughly 200 genes, and I would guess that at least 25% and maybe 50% of that genome, so we're talking 50 to 100 uh, different genes, are in are uh, enrolled in this uh, 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 anti-restriction type activity at all levels, both the intracellular and the extra and the more systemic ones. And we're going to address one of those today. In fact, in many ways, uh, the uh, pox virus thing is just, in, in a sense, just a probe uh, to uncover a cellular restriction pathway, which my guess is, is activated by numerous other viruses and probably counteracted by other viruses. But in this case, it was discovered uh, because of pox viruses. As so, have been many similar types yes. of immune processes. Yeah. So um, uh, I want to, as I said, summarize summarize the whole thing. And uh, a, a, as a first step, we have to try and, I don't know how successful this will be, but briefly review what tRNA is, which means recapping to some extent the whole central dogma. All right. So uh, information. Uh, uh, genetic information is stored in uh, nucleic acids in higher organisms, usually or almost exclusively, maybe exclusively DNA, double-stranded DNA, uh, which is a string of nucleotides. You remember uh, adenine, guanine, uh, uh, cytosine, and thymidine, okay? And a double-stranded structure that's base paired because the the bases can stick to each other, recognize each other. So everywhere in the double strand, there's an A. Opposite that, there's a T. Everywhere in the double strand that there's a G. Opposite that is a C. So each strand is a template for the other, and that preserves the gen, uh, uh, the genetic information. The workhorse of um, cells of life are proteins which are strings of amino acids. Amino acids, there are 20 of them rather than the four bases, and their chemistry is like totally different than the nucleotides. So what you have to do somehow is take a gene, which is a string of nucleotides, which encodes the sequence of amino acids and get that translated, decoded into a string of amino acids, okay? The key molecule in doing that translation is an adapter molecule that we call transfer RNA. And this is a small, single-stranded RNA molecule. And RNA can do all the same sort of base pairing stuff using the same principles as uh, in DNA. And this thing looks like a, looks like a cross, actually, um, with a, a long stem and two different wings. Okay? And at the bottom of that cross is a sequence of nucleotides that can base pair with a sequence of nucleotides in messenger RNA, which is the uh, temporary molecule that is transcribed from DNA to send a message for expression to, to get a, a, a protein made out from the nucleus in a higher organism in the, in the cytoplasm. So we have a messenger RNA that has a string of these codons, which are uh, three bases adjacent to each other, each of which encodes an amino acid. And in order to get the um, synthesis of a protein, the machine called a ribosome, one at a time, it captures the message and one at a time finds the tRNA with an anticodon that pairs with the appropriate codon, base pairs with the appropriate codon, that will have attached at its other end the right amino acid. Uh, for that cognate codon. In fact, the real magical molecules in all of these are enzymes, I won't go here, far here, called aminoacyl tRNA synthetases, which they actually hold the key because they can recognize a tRNA and know which amino acid to stick on it in preparation for this whole thing. Okay. Uh, so then, you know, this machine reads off the codons by plugging in tRNAs one at a time and, and uh, hooking together all the amino acids, and you got a protein at the other end. Yeah. So so if I were going to 
take this for people who have not taken a lot of molecular biology and not thought about molecular biology at all, the tRNA has one kind of tip with three bases on it that can read or find a complement pe- complementary piece of mRNA. So it's got one side that's the mRNA matchy side. <laughs> right. And then the other side carries in an amino acid. Right. Um, and helps us go from what was a string of nucleotides or a string of base pairs to help build the corresponding string of amino acids um, by matching the base three base pairs with the correct amino acid. Cool. So in this paper, this paper describes mostly a protein that cells contain that has the enzymatic act uh, an enzymatic activity consisting of being able to recognize the anticodon for a specific tRNA, phenylal- that carries phenylalanine, so it's the phenylalanyl tRNA. This protein can recognize the anticodon from that and cleave it, mm-hmm. thus destroying the tRNA. And if you do that, now all of a sudden you can't plug in any phenylalanine, you can't make any proteins, uh, and down the road the cell's going to die. Obviously, this is not a good thing to have around all the time. So in cells, mostly, this is in an inactive state, but it can be activated. All right. So this is this is one of those self-destruct systems that's just sitting around the cell, and it's like the apoptotic cascade or something. It's just there in case we need to just shut everything down. Yes, I think of it as a dead man's switch. Yes. Okay. So we're all carrying lots of dead man switches. Yeah, Every cell in our body It's of. amazing right. that we are alive. Yes. Well, you know, the idea is that that way we can get rid of a cell that is going to be a virus factory. Yeah. Um, or that's going to, to be keep, a tumor. To keep the rest of us alive. Yes. Uh, the, the, For the greater uh, good. The culprit in the particular protein we're talking about is something called SAMD9 which we will uh, get around to. Um, and uh, so the, uh, the story here is that SAMD9 must have some sort of sensor on it. I mean, it has a, an end to it that is a sensing molecule. The actual thing that it senses is not understood at this point. But when pox viruses and presumably other viruses infect a cell, mm. uh, this thing can sense that it's being infected and the protein is activated. Uh, yeah. And then the tRNA is cleaved, it shuts down protein synthesis, and the cell commits suicide. Uh, it, this was one of my early lessons in biology because it didn't make any sense to me that the cell would c- commit suicide, but it does make sense because if the cell commits suicide, then the virus can't finish its replication there and its buddies are saved, okay? This is falling on the hand grenade, okay? Right. And that that actually is the top-line summary of the paper because going into this paper... We didn't know that SAMD9 does this exactly. Correct. This, this protein was known. There are um, some rare mutations in it that cause really serious problems in humans with those mutations. And people had looked at this protein. It's ubiquitous. It's, you know, got to be doing something important. And it's got a structure that looks like this family of proteins called stand proteins, which is kind of a ridiculously named as signal transduction adenosine triphosphatases with numerous associated domains. <laughs> Stan. That's such an innate immunity name, this, though. This is it so is, this is. is so why people don't like immunology, you know? It, um, anyway, so these these stand proteins all have this structure, and the ones that have been really characterized all seem to be responding to molecular characteristics of infectious diseases, um, which are called pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs, uh, which we've talked about before on TWIV. Um, so these are, these are they look like they ought to be response proteins against an infection. But going into this paper, we didn't know exactly how that worked. And actually, you know, I don't, I don't nobody knows, as far as I know, whether these are actually involved to do this. Or something right. else. Yeah. All sure, right. Sure. Uh, and you know they may have other they may have other roles. They may have had other roles in evolution. But this is this is one job. So yeah. I, I when, should. Uh, uh, sorry, Brianne. Go ahead. No, you go ahead and finish. Um, uh, you know, 
this idea that something would be sort of this, I don't know, off the wall in a way to target a tRNA. I mean, I guess it makes sense. All right. But it's, it just, first time I encountered this, it struck me as, man, that is just wild. The fact is that this sort of mechanism of, of processing tRNAs as a, res, uh, a uh, to restrict a problem is not new. It's been uh, around in prokaryotes, uh, uh, understood in prokaryotes or uh, other organisms uh, for quite a while. But this apparently is the first example in a metazoan, a higher multicellular organism. First example in a eukaryote. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, the one thing that I think is key to think about with this protein is that sometimes when we think about um, responses to pathogen associated molecular patterns like this, um, sometimes we'll have sensing and then the cell will need to go through that whole process of transcription and translation and make a new product and, and stop things. And here the, pro the protein is already made. It, the protein is just going to switch its activity or start being turned on. So the protein was already there waiting around and can stop the virus right away. Um, it doesn't need to necessarily take a lot of time. Um, it can really stop that cell from being the virus production factory. So, so I have two comments here. First of all, that I think if the tRNA is very abundant and some are more than others, that this isn't a great strategy, right? Right. You and would I, think so. And phi is not one of the more abundant ones, so that's probably explaining that. The other thing is that if you carry this hand grenade, now and then the the pin's going to fall out, right? It's yeah. going to go off. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens in these diseases that, that uh, yeah. Rich mentioned. They're, and and, they're and I'm sure it happens, it probably happens in the body day to day in normal healthy people yes. that cells delete themselves that shouldn't have um, because the balance that has evolved would favor that. Like if you think something's wrong, just check out. You know, it's um, interesting. It depends on the pressure from the pathogen, right? Yes. Because if this, because if, if if you get a mutation in the gene encoding SAMD9, if it gets into the germline, then, uh, and it's a mutated version, then you're going to have some issues. You're not going to reproduce, yeah. Um, and that's what these, there are some rare disorders, they say, in bone marrow failure syndromes, where it, it, it's actually a missense mutation that truncates the protein. And we'll see why that makes a big difference uh, in a bit. But they call these gain of function yes. mutations, which is uh, I wanted to point out because nature does gain of function all the time. <laughs> yes, you know it, it's just that mutations happen, and if you're carrying this gene, I, so I'm thinking there must be a lot of pressure from pathogens to keep this, or maybe the the rare disorders are are rare and it doesn't matter. Right? Well, actually, uh, this discussion uh, gives me a little more insight into maybe the evolution of this because it could be that the whole thing evolved as a, you know, uh, an intrinsic dead man switch as, as Alan, as Alan described, you know, something goes wrong in the cell, you really need to delete that cell. And this is one way of doing it. Right. And, and they mention um, in the intro that SAMD9 in vitro could bind to double strand DNA. Um, and so perhaps it could be a sensor of any kind of yes. DNA getting lost from the nucleus, sure. um, not just viral Good DNA. Good point. Yeah. So uh, going into this, um, as background, this is, uh, Alan's already alluded to this, but we'll uh, quickly go over it in a little more detail. Um, what was known uh, is that, uh, uh, and this is uncovered by studying uh, basically, uh, pox virus mutants that uh, could not infect cells uh, uh, appropriately, uh, implying that one reason they may not be able to infect cells is that uh, they are deficient in some uh, anti-restriction factor. Factor. Okay, and this starts out with a study of that sort that showed. Uh, and this comes from um, a woman named Jia Lu, who was a postdoc at the time in Grant McFadden's laboratory, studying the related a box virus called Myxoma, uh, and published the first paper on this back in 2011, uh, that showed that the Myxoma equivalent of uh, C7 actually binds to and inactivates a cellular protein called SAMD9. So that was the original thing. And it was uh, subsequently... 
figured out in both Bernie's, Bernie Moss's lab and Yan Zhang's lab uh, that, in fact, two pox virus genes called K1 and C7 can both bind SAMD9 and uh, a homolog of SAMD, SAMD9 called SAMD9L uh, to uh, accomplish this uh, counteraction of restriction. Uh, it was known that the restriction is at the level of protein synthesis because uh, when the restriction occurs, protein synthesis shuts down. Uh, it was also known as, uh, uh, Alan has already pointed out, that this was a, a stand protein and that the effector domain uh, is a double-stranded uh, nucleic acid binding protein. Okay, so uh, we're looking at a restriction factor that may... Uh, uh, exert its activity somehow uh, by involving an interaction with a nucleic acid. And that's what we knew going into this. And the rest, the whole tRNA thing is figured out in this paper. And I love the sequence of logic that goes into this, okay? Because the first thing that happens is that they say, well, you know, there's actually two proteins um, that are uh, inhibited by C7 and K1. One is SAMD9, and the other is a thing called FTSJ1. Can you pronounce that? <laughs> FitzJ1. <laughs> okay. Another protein called FitzJ1. They're both um, uh, uh, inhibited by the same two pox virus genes, uh, C7 and K1. Um, not only that, <clears throat> but it was known already that FitzJ1 is an activatable, uh, I'm sorry, is uh, a tRNA phenylalanine methyltransferase. Okay. So that's what draws their attention to tRNA phenylalanine. All right. And that, that's absolutely key to this. What do we mean by a methyltransferase? Uh, tRNAs are heavily chemically modified after they're made in all sorts of different ways, one of which includes uh, adding, this is actually a ribose uh, methyl transferase, includes adding a methyl group to the uh, ribose on one of the a very specific base or two very specific bases uh, in the tRNA, just a couple of nucleotides removed from the anticodon, okay? So it marks that tRNA, those, and those modifications can have uh, several functional effects on the, on the tRNA. And so they go into this thinking, okay, so maybe because of this association, uh, tRNA phi uh, is somehow involved in all this. So they start off <clears throat> by um, confirming that uh, fits J1 is uh, an important restriction factor by overexpressing it in HeLa cells and showing that it inhibits virus expression, uh, uh, inhibits virus reproduction. Um, and then they uh, go further to uh, show that uh, fits J1 that cannot um, methylate tRNA uh, cannot restrict the virus. The way these are set up is to have a cell that has a, uh, an inducible copy that you've put in of this restriction factor, fits J1, either the wild type or a mutant. Uh, and then you infect the cells with the appropriate mutant of vaccinia that wouldn't be able to replicate. Uh, this is a C7 K, uh, C7, K1 double mutant. So ordinarily it would be restricted, wouldn't be able to replicate. Uh, and what you find is that if you induce Fitz J1 under those uh, circumstances, uh, it can inhibit the virus replication. But if you use a copy of Fitz J1 that can't methylate tRNA, it no longer can, can restrict. So that's telling you that Fitz J1, which seems to be involved in this pathway, um, that uh, uh, it, it is involved and the methylation, and it's further implicating uh, the, uh, the phi tRNA in this. So then, and this is kind of the critical experiment in a way, they have a closer look. They say, okay, now we're looking at, uh, we're uh, focusing our attention on tRNA phi, 
what is its status uh, in cells that are infected with these uh, vaccinia mutants. So it's, it, this activity is induced. Um, and they have a closer look at uh, tRNA phi itself. They infect uh, HeLa cells with a mutant or HeLa cells that are deleted for this restriction factor with the same mutant. And they do, by God, northern blots, mm -hmm. um, which is what many people would regard as an archaic technology for looking at uh, RNAs in infected cells to look specifically at what happens to tRNA phi. And they see that under conditions where the virus replication is being restricted, tRNA phi uh, actually you can detect two small subfragments of that thing. So it looks as if tRNA phi is being cleaved. It's being cleaved. Yep. So in order to zero their attention in that a little more, they've done work on SAMD9 before, so they actually have a, uh, a clone of SAMD9. It's not the whole protein. It's uh, basically the effector domain of the protein. It's missing some of the other stuff that they can – uh, uh, they have clones so they can purify the protein and they can do enzymatic activities with the protein. So they just take, uh, uh, RNA that they've, uh, purified from cells and do an enzymatic assay, uh, uh, uh adding that, incubating that with this recombinant SAMD9 protein, uh, and looking at the results. And sure enough, the SAMD9 protein seems to cleave the tRNA into two bits that they can identify of, you know, a five prime and a three prime fragment. And I've got to say, I love, I, I loved reading this and saying, oh, just a Northern blot. Oh, you so you just did biochemistry. <laughs> yeah. you just, you're not, yeah. you're not sequencing anything yeah. yet. You're just, you're just doing the basic, elegant, cheap experiments that cut right to what's going on here. And they're going to do the more sophisticated, you know, more modern stuff later, but this is this is lovely. So, does this imply that the effector domain, you know, is is doing this cleavage, and the rest of the stuff that's missing is involved in regulation? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Okay. The effector domain. So, and in fact, so we have a there's there's a, a sensing domain, uh, and then there's this nucleotide oligomerization domain. That if it works the same in this, I looked up some about Stan proteins. I, I know a bit about the Nod domain. Okay, good. Well, go for it. Take us to the land of Nod, Brian. <laughs> well, uh, there's a whole family of Nod proteins that contain the Nod domain, um, and they involve nucleotide oligomerization, and they are all PRRs from both uh, metazoans and animals uh, and plants in. in a wide array, array of um, organisms, and they, usually they involve make some sort of oligomerization after binding. Right. So uh, there's one other experiment that they do in this particular figure, which is to take tRNAs from either uh, wild-type uh, cells or cells that have a, a FITZ, uh, FITZ-J1 knockout and see if those are cleaved by SAMD9. And this is actually quite interesting because tRNAs from wild type, in fact, uh, wild type cells are cleaved. tRNAs from the FITZ-J1 cells are not cleaved. That's presumably because from the wild type cells, they're methylated, mm -hmm. okay? And from the FITZ-J1 cells, they aren't. So the methylation is important in, all the, in this whole process. It has to be a methylated RNA that I think probably ultimately uh, makes it so that it's recognizable by uh, uh, by SAMD1 to be cleaved. So at that point now, we have established that SAMD1 uh, is uh, an activatable enzyme that when activated- SAMD9. Can, SAMD9 uh, <laughs> Sam, uh, can cleave phenylalanine tRNA and that the FITZ-J1 methylation is important in that process. So now they go deep, they take a deeper dive uh, into- uh, looking at what is it about the protein that's important and what is it about the substrate that's important in two, uh, 
two figures. And I'm not going to go through in the, uh, this stuff in detail. They actually have a crystal structure of this functional a functional domain, which I think they had from uh, an earlier study. Uh, they, and, yeah, they previously did that. And they do um, what in the local uh, jargon may be called uh, wreck and check. Uh, that is, <laughs> uh, make a bunch of different mutants. Uh, they can predict what might be the important uh, amino acids, important in both binding the RNA uh, and in doing the cleavage activity by looking at the structure mm -hmm. that they have so that they can target their attention on these, okay? Then they go through and they do mutagenesis uh, and do assays to ask whether various mutants can still bind the RNA uh, and whether uh, various mutants can still do the cleavage. And they discover mutants that are deficient in binding. They discover mutants that are deficient in uh, the cleavage reaction by doing the appropriate in vitro experiments. And uh, this is all consistent with the uh, three-dimensional structure uh, of the protein that they've worked out. So they've effectively now uh, uh, defined at, uh, the atomic level, what the active site of the protein is that does the cleavage. And they even then go back and show that if they, um, uh, have cells that carry various of these, uh, mutants and infect them with the virus, that the cells are defective in restriction. So they have a biological correlate for the in vitro assays that they've done. And there's another figure here where they show that it's a, uh, it's a, basically a, I guess you'd call it a, well, it requires a, uh, uh, ion, uh, ion cofactor, magnesium or manganese, uh, in order to do its activity. So, uh, that defines the enzymatic activity of this thing. And all of these things, uh, you know, it's a story that builds on itself. So as you go through and drill down deeper, it reinforces the initial story. So now in a subsequent figure, they look at the substrate. <laughs> so they take the RNA, uh, or actually a subfragment that will serve, that contains the anti-codon loop and a few other uh, base pairs that are at the, what uh, um, uh, Brienne would have uh, defined as one end, or in my mind, the bottom, because that's the way they're right. usually represented of the TRA. Right. So, so now the question that they that comes up is: All right, SAMD9 can cleave tRNA. How does it know which tRNA yeah. to cleave? Right. And so, so that's they take this fragment. They take yes. a fragment it's like about thirty-eight nucleotides. All right, and once again, wreck and check, make a whole bunch of different mutants and do the reaction. And long story short, and it's just a, you know, I'm sure I'm summarizing a two or three people's thesis work in uh, mm -hmm. a couple of sentences here, <laughs> but this is figure three F, by the way, this is open access. Yeah. Uh, figure three F shows the results of all these experiments. And it's really striking what the recognition uh, piece is because we have what? One, two, three, four five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 nucleotides that has a stem loop at the top that's got to be greater than two nucleotides in length. And then the anti-codon loop uh, or equivalent in the bottom. And out of that entire structure, there are only two nucleotides that have to be of a specific character. Uh, and that is one that I guess is right in the anti-codon loop. And now I don't think so, actually, because that's the, one of the methylated ones. Uh, so I thought the wasn't that one. I thought that one was. Okay. Yeah, the methylated it, it, it one certainly, was important. It looks like that in the, uh, yeah, it is. It's so, and that has to be, it doesn't have to be, it has to be a purine. Yes. Okay. So that's either what? Uh, guanine or adenine it can be either one, and it has to be methylated, right? And then two nucleotides upstream from that, there's a, a nucleotide that has to be a pyrimidine, so that's going to be either a uracil or a cytosine. 
all the others can be whatever they want as long as they're in a structure that maintains this base pairing in the in, in the loop okay the interesting thing to me is that just those few features are enough to distinguish that as a phenylalanine tRNA okay how does as all of the yeah, RNA that seems so crazy the cell the cytoplasm is a wash in RNA and only phenylalanine tRNA has this set of features crazy yeah okay so now we got an enzyme that does this uh and we know uh in quite a bit of detail how it is that it can pick out tRNA fee which is still so weird mm. <laughs> <laughs> so then what actually happens in the cells uh when we when we do this so i have to uh um reboot here so uh, what they do is that they uh, infect cells uh, with either uh, wild-type vaccinia or the mutant, which will be restricted. Uh, and they then use uh, analysis of the bulk tRNAs. Uh, they can distinguish individual tRNAs, okay? But they look, they harvest all the tRNAs and then ask, what is the, the abundance mm. of each of the appropriate tRNAs under those conditions? And they're comparing conditions of restriction versus not restriction. And basically, um, uh, almost all of the transfer RNAs that are in the cells uh, are at the sa roughly the same level when they're when you infect with either wild type vaccinia or the mutant that is not restricted. But if you compare the level of phenylalanine tRNA GAA, which is the one that uh, sees this particular anticodon or codon, um, then you find that uh, in the cells that are restricted, that thing is depleted relative to the cells that aren't depleted. And uh, it's a striking result. It, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Then this next experiment boggles the mind. What are the consequences of that for protein synthesis? So what they do is they do the same sort of thing, comparing wild type versus a, a restricted uh, infection. And they do uh, a sophisticated type of ribosome profiling. Okay. Where what they do is they, uh, ex uh, they isolate from the infected cells ribosomes that are in the act of translation. They do this using sucrose gradients, okay, where you can isolate these complexes of ribosomes and RNA. And then this is the... And, and right before you do that, you add a chemical hmm. that makes the ribosome stop right, right where it yeah, is stop on where you the are. RNA. No stop where you are. See where it was. Right. Yes. Hanging out, trying yeah. to do translation. Um, and then, so this, this procedure is called riboseq. Right. Uh, and then you take that, uh, that uh, bunch of translating ribosomes and you actually uh, tickle it with a ribonuclease so that the only RNA that survives is the stuff that's actually uh, contained inside the ribosome. So it's actively being translated and you get rid of all the other stuff. And then you take that mass of material and you sequence it. And this is set up in a fashion so that, and I don't understand the details of this, but it's set up in a fashion so that you can actually, uh, sense what the reading frame is. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, in that protected stuff, uh, which reading frame you're in. So you know what are being seen as codons and, uh, and what aren't, and you can out of this, you get what is the relative codon occupancy uh, in a wild type infection versus a mutant infection. That is, uh, where are the where are the are they sitting? Are the ribosomes sitting e evenly on all the different codons, or are some codons occupied more than others? And what they find is that under conditions where the infection is being restricted, the tRNA phi is being destroyed, that the phenylalanine codons uh, are vastly overrepresented. So the interpretation of that is that the, uh, the ribosomes are paused 
they're over stalling. those codons. They're, yeah, they're stalled. stuck because they can't get exactly. hey, matching hey, TRNA. I need a phenylalanine. Anybody? Yeah. Phenylalanine. Uh, so that and there me, was no answer. As a yeah. as a picture, <laughs> yeah. as a picture of what's going on, that's mind boggling. They're sitting there yeah. on this codon waiting. Right. And there's no TRNA, so they can't go any further. Supply chain problem. Yeah. <laughs> and it's pretty dramatic. Yes. Uh, yeah. The difference that you see here. Like, it's not like there's a couple more that are stuck no. on that codon compared to other codons. It's, what is that? I mean, three, four times as many. Yep. It's big. Yeah. It's big. I think it's interesting. Yeah, this, the other... is, this is one of those modern techniques I alluded to when we were when we were <laughs> the, uh... gushing over the northern. So I'm sure the millennials in the lab were happy that oh, good, we can finally use 21st century technology now. <laughs> it's interesting but this that, is a really that cool the other result. tRNAs aren't all the same. You know, some of them are under yes. re, under, yeah, and yep. some of them are over. It's curious, right? This is, this is probably uh, related to codon usage, right? Yeah, yes. that was what I was wondering. Is maybe some of those are are the more frequently yeah, used ones. Yeah. That's a very cool technique, yeah. So uh, then as a couple of uh, uh, additional bits of information, uh, they sort of, this sort of confirms not only the specificity, but the uh, activation state of this enzyme in cells, okay? So they have cells that express either wild type in, a, in an inducible fashion, either the wild type or one of these gain of function uh, SAMD9 mutants. Uh, and they look at the... Uh, amount of uh, either feed tRNA or as a control leucine tRNA in those cells. And basically what they find is that if you overexpress the form of this that uh, uh, is um, constitutively active, the gain of function mutant, that those cells uh, are deficient in phenylalanine tRNA. So this is confirmatory that this in cells uh, uh, can do this. Um, so, and, and uh, under the same circumstances, they do the uh, codon occupancy experiment and show that in those cells where this thing is active, the phenylalanine codons, uh, the ribosomes are paused over the phenylalanine codons. Man, as if that weren't enough. <laughs> so uh, this next bit is... A bit of a sideshow, but it's interesting because it opens up a bunch of other stuff. They say, basically, are there downstream effects of all this? What mm -hmm. else goes on? All right. Is this the whole story? Uh, and so what they do is um, uh, gene profiling uh, in cells that are either infected with wild-type vaccinia or uninfected or cells that have the constitutive SAMD uh, mutant in it, either uninduced or induced. And they ask under conditions where the tRNA is being cleaved, uh, are there any other gene expression changes that might be relevant? And they focus their, and there are, and they focus their attention on one of these, which is a protein called, am I going to get this right? Yes. ATF3. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a transcription factor that uh, is induced, which uh, in, in, um, in retrospect, I don't understand the subtleties of these, maybe somebody else does, in, in, in retrospect is a logical consequence of arresting protein synthesis uh, in this fashion. The point that I got out of this mostly is that this cleavage of the tRNA is not the only thing that goes on, that that sets off a cascade of events that has more global effects on uh, gene expression and protein synthesis. Yeah, I like the name ribotoxic stress. Ribotoxic yeah. stress. Ribotoxic it, stress. What, what I get from this is that the, um, the, the stoppage at phenylalanine and this kind of global turndown of translation fires off the alarms of the cell, you know, just generally like, whoa, something's really wrong. Um, and that's the ribotoxic stress response that they're seeing in the gene. So profiling. Rich, the ATF3 is a well-known stress-induced transcription factor. Okay. So any kind of stress, which is here, it's ribotoxic stress, but you could have any other kind in there. And then it, it goes on and does things to the cell that are you know, to respond to the stress so you don't keep growing, dividing, and metabolizing, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, they they talk about um, EIF two alpha or EIF two A here. Yeah, um, as well, and that's another really well known kind of protein that's involved in the stress response. So, and so, we're we're turning on the char- otherwise well characterized stress right. response. Right. So, so would it be fair to say then that starting with trashing tRNA phi, that's not the whole story. It the 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 there are downstream effects. Yeah. That yeah. are. Yeah. Uh, uh, stress responses in general that probably ultimately uh, contribute to the whole suicide. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 So ter- turning turning off translation is setting off the fire alarm. Right. Yeah. Everybody's leaving the building. Burning down yes. the house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the the last bit of this is okay. So we're saying that uh, trashing tRNA phi. Uh, is restrictive. Can we prove that by supplying back in the uh, cells that are experiencing this restriction, tRNA phi? Uh, this, frankly, is the figure that I had the most trouble with. Uh, uh, and I, I uh, because of that, I'm reluctant to try and describe in detail, unless somebody else wants to tackle it, exactly how this is done. Uh, but it, it, it has to do with supplying cells with uh, a uh, fluorescently labeled version of SAMD9 and infecting them with uh, vaccinia, which also uh, is during its replication fluoresces, so that you can look at how much SAMD9 uh, is around versus how much infection is happening, and then supply these with uh, uh, tRNA as well. And what you find is that um, if you supply uh, tRNA uh, phi in excess, you can reduce the effects of the uh, SAMD9. Is that a right. fair statement? Yeah, that's absolutely mm-hmm. right. Yep. And uh, without going into further detail, that's it. Cells carry this protein that has at least this activity as a restriction factor that is ordinarily turned off. Uh, and when and uh, when uh, virus when a virus like vaccinia, probably other viruses as well, infect the cell, this protein can sense the uh, in an unknown fashion the presence of the virus uh, and uh, activate the enzyme. That enzyme then cleaves uh, a specific tRNA tRNA phi, which has the effect of halting protein synthesis. That has the effect of, in addition, turning on a stress response uh, and ultimately causing suicide of the cell. And remember, the virus it doesn't like this. Under normal circumstances, this particular virus carries with it countermeasures, which are two different proteins that'll bind this very protein, SAMD9, and keep all this from happening. Right. So I think the one thing I would say about the data in this figure, just that ties into what you mentioned is that they are looking, as you said, at the fluorescent um, vac infection. Um, They're looking for cells that are green that have vaccinia and the cells that are red that have SAMD9. And because SAMD9 is supposed to restrict vaccinia, you would expect the cells that got SAMD9 would have no vaccinia and the cells that had vaccinia would have no SAMD9. And so there should be no cells that are both red and green or in the upper right. Right quadrant. But it turns out if you put in extra tRNA, you can get some cells to do that because you're overriding the SAMD9. Excellent. Thank you. You're you're much more used to looking at flow cytometry. This, this is my bread and butter. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I, I puzzled over these things forever because I wasn't quite sure which quadrant to look at. I think I finally got where you were. Upper okay. right. Yeah, upper right. Okay. Excellent. Okay, I, that's it. I think it's interesting yep. that they say, you know, maybe we could give tRNA phi therapy to take care of some of these diseases that are uh, based on SAMD9 changes, you know. That's speculative. I mean, they've got to say something to tie well, it into, mean, if, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's an idea. Could be, could be. I mean, yeah. you could do some yeah, uh, you'd animal have to, models. You'd have to do gene therapy to overexpress yeah. tRNA phi or something. The uh, other thing is that these uh, gain-of-function changes that are in these people who have these diseases that have changes in a SAMD9 gene, they're, they're missense, which means they 
introduce a stop codon. And so the regulatory part of the protein is gone. So right. it's it's always on. It's always cleaving tRNA phi, and that's why you have problems. Right. Which is yeah, it. So we should probably figure something out about how that regulation works. Yes. I think so. So I have I have, you know, in in summary, sort of two personal wows about this. Uh, you know, to, just to sort of communicate what it is about science and this kind of science that floats my boat, okay? Uh, the first is, uh, you can't make this stuff up. It's like, <laughs> this is like Rube Goldberg to the max, all right? Uh, or maybe not. I'm not sure. Maybe if Maybe if you were thinking, how are we going to... How are we going to combat this infection? Maybe this is exactly what you would come up with. Let's cleave the tRNAs and commit suicide. But <laughs> on the other hand, it looks like like totally Rube Goldberg. I don't know which it is, but it's amazing. It's just um, that all of this, it's amazing that any of this stuff works to start with, but that then there's all these subplots going mm -hmm. on. It's incredible. My other wow is uh, to all of the authors on this paper, good on you. What an amazing job and very nicely presented. It just makes yes. a beautiful story and so thorough. And all of the data are really clean. And it's really, if I could do, if I could do just part of one of these figures in my whole career, I would be really pleased. And this, <laughs> and this is the whole show. It's great. Yeah. And this is, um, this paper, it's, it's really well structured and yeah. presented in yeah. a logical fashion. Well, we looked at this and we noticed this and then we looked at that and now we're going to see, oh, well, that it could be this. So let's drill down. And it's just really it's a nicely structured paper. And I, I also um, think it's really cool that they found these um, these anti this anti codonase, uh, an ACNase, which in in the bacterial world is a common enough thing that there's actually, it's called an ACNase. I mean, they've got an abbreviation for this thing because it comes up in multiple bacterial yeah. species, but those don't resemble the sequence of SAMD9. And that suggests that this same strategy evolved independently in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, right. which kind of gets back to riches. My gosh, how the hell does this work? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's, you know, so I guess maybe nature thinks that this is not such a wild idea anyway. Okay, <laughs> it has come up more <laughs> than come, once. Come up yes. more than once. Rich, what? Um, how do the uh, pox uh, antagonists work? Do you know the the uh, the K one and C seven proteins? They uh, all I know. And I actually emailed uh, Yan about this beforehand, and he sent me this figure that I plugged in here uh, that uh, shows that uh, both K1 and C7 bind to SAMD9 okay. in different places, okay? okay. So, uh, you know, the extrapolation of that is that that binding must compromise the activity somehow. But uh, more detail than that, I don't know. Okay. And also that we don't know what the activator is by, you know, in no. effect cells, but I would guess it, it's nucleic acid of some kind. I like, right? I like Brianne's idea. Yeah. yeah. Any, any sort of uh, rogue nucleic acid might set this sucker off. Right. Because it does have, this protein binds double-stranded nucleic acids. Yeah. So yeah. maybe uh, double-stranded RNA, which would not be in an uninfected cell, something like that. The same thing that would turn on uh, PKR. Right, and it, if it's a cytoplasmic protein, then it shouldn't be seeing much double strand DNA either. Shouldn't be, except you know it does leak out of. Right, right. but that's a, but that would be a sign that something's yeah. wrong with the cell. Yeah, that's where a lot of the sensing happens. That's right. So that's cool. It's a, it's lovely, absolutely lovely. Yeah, beautiful yeah. paper. <clears throat> yeah. All right, let's let's do a, a round of email. Uh, let's see. I will take this first one from Rose. Uh, Rose is a health reporter in North Carolina, and she found in the New York Times comment section of an article about COVID, um, a lovely, a lovely note from someone who, uh, thanks, who says, I, I listened to two podcasts to get all my information about <laughs> COVID. 
uh, and one of them is this week in virology. It's very interesting that uh, the Times left it in there. I guess they can't really take it out, right? <laughs> because you would think, no, you're not going to give someone else a clue. In the past few months, I've discovered two sources of reliable information about COVID and other infectious diseases. One is the, is the TWIV. Hey, we are the TWIV. This the week TWIV. in Virology <laughs> Podcast, which every week has a clinical update, and the epidemiologist mentioned in this story, Dr. Hetelina, who writes your local uh, epidemiologist newsletter. In addition, TWIV has a YouTube channel and podcast with experts discussing a range of issues. It's excellent. As a retired health care professional, I really appreciate the approach that they take in getting out solid, reliable information. My favorite quote from the podcast, nobody is safe till everybody is safe is repeated at the end of each episode. I wonder if she's Ruth. <laughs> Maybe Ruth wrote the letter. <laughs> <laughs> Rose, you mean. Rose, because she's a health, Rose. she's retired and she's a health reporter. Yeah. Maybe. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Rose. So, <laughs> Thank you, Rose. Uh, do, uh, do any of you folks uh, follow um, um, the your local epidemiologist. No, I don't. I've heard good things about it, but I don't. Know I've it. um I've uh, actually I had a pick uh, a couple of episodes ago, which was the grand rounds from Johns Hopkins, right? Where she was one of the speakers, and I've seen her on the PBS NewsHour uh, uh, frequently, and she's really good. She's really good. She uh, uh, communicates very clearly and has a nice smile, which. Uh, makes it fun to listen to. Yeah, she's very good. Uh, Rich, why don't you take the next one? Okay. Nikki writes, love your show. You are both smart and fun to listen to. Most of all, I appreciate the timely and valuable information you share with listeners. Question, what is your advice on choral singing? Does that advice change based on a chorus that is 80 to 100 voices with approximately half being over 65 years old. Appreciate your thoughts. Many thanks, Nikki. I presume that this is relevant to COVID. Yeah, I think right? so. Yes. <laughs> um, my, my advice is practice, practice, practice. <laughs> <laughs> so I can speak to this uh, to some extent uh, for two reasons. One, um, uh, we've discussed this. If you go back... <laughs> A hundred or so episodes, you know, especially early and during the pandemic or at various times, but uh, leading up to shutdowns and uh, after shutdowns, um, uh, how to approach uh, choral singing. And both uh, Kathy and I do this. All right. So it is of particular concern to us. And uh, uh, first of all, it is noteworthy that singing in a crowd is a terrific way to spread SARS-CoV-2 around, okay? Because or any other respiratory or virus. any other respiratory virus, because you're yep. basically expelling droplets uh, as vigorously as you possibly can in close proximity to other people. Um, and uh, my advice basically is to uh, one be aware of that that it actually is an issue, uh, and two, you know, uh, I don't know, take. Take appropriate precautions. We went through a, uh, okay, so coming out of the pandemic, um, when my chorus was uh, uh, during the, actually, it was on March 11th of 2020 when uh, that was when the WHO, I think, uh, uh, set off the alarms and critical to that alarm was the understanding that this could spread asymptomatically. All right. Which meant that you didn't know you couldn't, you couldn't identify people who might be spreading this and take them out of the group. All right. Uh, when that happened, I immediately emailed, uh, the uh, um, uh, actually I'm, I'm one of them, the, uh, board, if you like, for our chorus, the people who oversee the whole thing and said, uh, I'm not sure we ought to be getting together singing. Okay. And we shut it down and we, for a period of time, a long period of time, just got together on zoom, which you can't really sing. We, there are several episodes that talk about hmm. how to do that. Uh, and then when we got back together, 
We were singing outdoors in a parking garage wearing masks. <laughs> uh, and you could not join in that activity unless you were vaccinated. Mm. All right. Uh, and then ultimately we moved inside vaccination required wearing masks. Uh, and then over time, as things sort of let up, we dropped the vaccination and masking restriction. Uh, and we uh, cautioned people uh, that if they're at all suspicious that they may have had a significant exposure or actually uh, have uh, the virus to stay the hell away. Um, and sometimes, you know, lots of times people will, well, they'll certainly do that, but then they'll, for a period of time after that, show up masked. All right. And we have some individuals who have um, uh, underlying conditions uh, who mask uh, routinely. Uh, I don't know, you know, if a, in a large chorus to address your letter, the probability that there's going to be a problem goes up. I can't put a number on it. Okay. But the more, the more people, the bigger the probability, uh, uh, I would assume. But anytime you put a crowd of people together, uh, if there's one in the crowd, it's going to, uh, who's, uh, uh, transmitting virus, it's going to be a problem. Uh, I would say now in our chorus, <clears throat> um, there's only, uh, we, we have 30 people on the risers, usually 25, 30 people. Uh, there's one or two people who wear masks routinely. Uh, there are quite a few people, myself included, who are in, who are, uh, north of 65 years old, uh, and some who have some, uh, underlying conditions as well. Typically they're not masked. Because singing in a mask is such a drag. We did that, all right? Pandemic is a drag. Um, yeah, yeah, the pandemic is a drag. So I think right now, unless there are really extenuating circumstances, uh, the way we're behaving is we're going about our business, okay? But we're keeping an eye peeled for respiratory diseases. We have a safety policy in place, uh, place that says COVID or any other respiratory uh, problem, stay the hell away, okay? seems to me that everybody should be vaccinated and have yeah. a plan, like Daniel says. Yeah. Be ready yeah. to take Paxlovid or Remdesivir yeah. because that's, that's and, what will save the way, your life. This, this and should stay home if you're sick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and by the way, this should come up in a couple of months in flu season, which is still a thing. Um, so, yeah, if you get sick and you test negative for COVID – um, and you know, you do one of those rapid antibody tests and you yeah, still not feeling so good. Stay home. Remember if the first, you could have the, if the first, you could mat, have the flu, the you could first kill somebody. If the first is negative, do it again. Yeah. Right. And if that one's negative, I don't want your other stuff yeah, I don't want, yeah, exactly. That's my point is if you really are totally negative for SARS-CoV-2 and you are still not feeling well, I don't want to see you. I just... <laughs> people in general should stay home when they're sick. But yes. as we know, people don't do that. And for a variety uh, of reasons. And, yeah, and for some people that's hard that's that's tough. You know, that's a problem. that means yeah. no that means no money for that day. Yeah. Okay? Which ought to be fixed, but that's something yeah. we can't so, apparently uh, do. So uh I um I think mm. number one, if you can, for any of these respiratory disease, get vaccinated. All right. That is if a vaccine is available, take it. All right. I don't care whether you've been infected before or not. Get the vaccine. And uh, so using myself as an example, um, I've had five shots and COVID. <laughs> I did that. All After right. the five shots. Uh, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Carol writes, I watched the new Debunk the Funk about the ridiculous documentary, The Viral Delusion, and I thought maybe you could have a psychologist or sociologist on to discuss the following questions. WTF is wrong with people. <laughs> Why would anyone make a video claiming viruses don't cause diseases? Who's profiting financially and how from anti-vax lies? I can speak to that in a moment. Uh, how is it that so many people fall for crap like that? Are people leaving high school that poorly educated? Yes. Is some bizarre is this some is it some bizarre form of resistance to authority? Yes. yes. 
Mm -hmm. I can't wrap my head around this and don't know what should be done. I try to educate people on social media and they call me a lemming. <laughs> it's very frustrating not getting anywhere with them, especially with all the COVID deaths and disabilities being caused by disinformation. I got a lot out of your discussion with David Tuller. Thanks for that. That episode has gotten 7,800 views so far. All right. So, Carol, um, what is wrong with people is a question I have been pondering for decades without a clear answer. But um, who's profiting financially and how from anti-vax lies? There Actually, there is money to be made in this and there is power to be gained from this. Andrew Wakefield, who propagated the granddaddy of a lot of this modern anti-vax nonsense, he was certainly not the first anti-vaxxer, but... Um, thanks to investigative journalist, uh, an investigative journalist named Brian Deere, we now know that Andrew Wakefield, at the time he was putting together his BS paper trying to link vaccines to autism, he was also pitching a business plan to capitalize on that fear in a huge way, so which involved... It, yeah, was part of it that he was trying to... Um, destabilized the trivalent vaccine because he wanted to because he was going to help someone who was trying to make a monovalent. That was part of it. Yeah. <laughs> and he was also uh, working with attorneys in the UK to st to set up to um, sue vaccine manufacturers. And he made millions off these schemes, even though they didn't pan out. He took the money and I think, you know, bought a really nice house in the Austin area. Um, after he'd been banned from medicine in the UK, but you know, didn't matter. He'd, he'd made his money. Uh, so yeah, people are making a ton of money by selling this kind of thing. And it's the same sort of scam that goes back to literal snake oil salesmen in the 19th century. Okay. There are people who will line up to be fleeced by this nonsense. And as PT Barnum had it, there's one born every minute. Um, RFK Jr. is running for president, and he's making statements that put him in the news. It's pretty easy to see how that could benefit him. Um, and so that's that's what's to gain from the people at the top of this. And the rest of the folks who are signing on to it are constructing an, an identity, a group identity around it. You know, hey, I'm I'm a free thinker. I'm going to, you know, do this and F your vaccine. And I'm going to be with these people over here who we're going to be rebels together. That's the appeal. So, Carol, uh, I just released today, which is Friday, a video interview with uh, Desiree Townsend, who uh, talks about her experience with the uh, anti-vax crowd. And, uh, you know, she had a, a reaction after a flu vaccine in 2009 and they, she didn't know any better, and they came and got her, and uh, they tried to make money off of her. And she figured it out, and she's talking about it. It's very interesting. Very interesting. It's, um, and she has. They, they, uh, they were, they were filming all of her treatments. She was getting these bogus treatments, and and in exchange for filming them they paid for the treatments and she got to keep the footage so she showed some of the footage and one of them so she had tried out for the washington redskins cheerleader and she made it and then she got this flu shot and then she deteriorated so the guy said she's gonna be the next jenny mccarthy taken down she, redskin cheerleader taken down by the flu shot <laughs> uh, I'll be very interested to see that. This guy, this guy says it on the video. It's very funny. I actually remember when she went viral on Facebook yep, yep. initially it, with this. And I said, yeah. why, did, why did you do all this? She said, I was 25. I didn't know anything. And these people were all telling me uh, it's the vaccine. And then she got hooked up with these doctors. And she said, the one guy kept saying, it's the mercury. It's the mercury. <laughs> You know, but those, uh, the, uh, uh, our, which hasn't been in vaccines for years. Yeah. <laughs> our experience is that those sorts of personal stories are really powerful in, yes. in communicating yeah. whatever it is you want to communicate. Of and course, I, uh, I'm reminded that, um, uh, it's Dan Wilson, right? Yeah. The Dan Wilson. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in that first, uh, episode where we interviewed him, he revealed 
that he had been a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, that's right. In his youth, yeah. uh, and then uh, you know saw the light. Yep. And it wasn't it wasn't a flash of brilliance all of uh, all of a sudden. He had to work his way out of 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 the cave uh, to the light. Um, so you know. Finding the truth takes work. Yeah. All right. Uh, and yeah, it's much easier. Sure. It's much easier just to you know go go along with whatever the current mania is. In particular, because yeah. people you know gravitate towards horror stories. Um, uh, so that's that's part of what's wrong with people. You know, it's it's hard. All right. And we are important. all susceptible to this. Yeah. Oh, all yeah. of us. Richard it's Feynman. The easiest person to fool is you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The, uh, the thing, the thing is, uh, she recognized at some point that these guys are all in it for the money. You know, they're talking yeah. about how much money they're going to make from her, and then she says she got nothing, right? <laughs> and then she realized it was all a, a scam. So she, I, I said, "Why are you speaking out now? It's a long time afterwards." She said, "I want to take him down." <laughs> so, uh, Vincent, what, what? Uh, what I mean, you got so many podcasts now. It's Where, Twiv. Uh, it's just a Twiv special I released today. Okay. Twiv special. Okay. Yeah. Right. Cool. I, I talked to her on uh, I don't know Tuesday, and I just put it out, and uh, she she said uh, before I talk to the press, I want to give it to Twiv. I love Twiv. I've been listening to Twiv for years. Oh, good for her. Oh, that awesome! Yay! Cool. And I want to give you, you guys uh, before I talk to everybody else so uh we did a chat and it was good we I, i've spliced in some of these videos where they uh talk about her as the next jenny mccarthy you know <laughs> it's, it's quite cool great excellent yeah that's dropped it's available it's now? dropped you can go see it yep okay cool cool um uh, uh, brianne can you take the next one please sure allison writes I just listened to the West Nile episode, and someone wrote in saying she can't read some of the articles you share. This is a partial solution, but the New York Times and Washington Post, and maybe others, allow paying subscribers to gift 10 articles a month to their friends. I've seen other newsletter writers use this feature to ensure their subscribers can read the articles they're curating. The next draft newsletter is the first time I've seen this feature being used this way. Um, she gives a link to the next draft um, this won't work for the Atlantic and other publications who don't offer the feature. Thanks for all that you do. Um, and there's also links here to the New York Times and Washington Post gift subscription um, links. Cool. I also think that everybody ought to subscribe to the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Atlantic, okay? <laughs> and support those organizations and read their stuff. I will tell anyone who is in an academic position that you can get academic subscriptions um, through your, your institution uh, for all to all of those, either for a dramatically discounted price or for free, depending on the institution. Yeah, I confess I cheat. My New York Times subscription comes to me that way. Yeah. I um, also want to remind people that if you email the authors of a paper, they can send you the PDF. Yes. Most yes. People are happy mm -hmm. to do that. I'll take one more because it's relevant to today's uh, first article. Charmaine writes, not 7 million. This is death, COVID deaths, but more like 20 million people are thought to have died globally from COVID-19. And she um, cites, WHO raises global COVID deaths to 20 million and provides a link for that. Also, I did recently hear this figure as well on a podcast or a news program. Can't remember who, but it was a reputable source. I listened to only reputable <laughs> sources <laughs> thank you thank charmaine you. great all right time for some picks of the week brianne what do you have for us um so i have a book that i read er a little earlier this summer and i really enjoyed um this book's called project hail mary by andy weir he is the author of the martian for those of you who might be familiar with his earlier work um so this is another of his sci-fi related um uh, books, but it does have some biology in it. Um, there's actually one place where there's a discussion of using pipettes in space. And I actually was like, but that's not what Kate Rubin said. <laughs> 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 um, and there's one other place where I had to kind of um, be generous with one piece of biological understanding. But in general, I really enjoyed this book. Uh, most of the people I know who've read it 
uh, really enjoyed it. It's it's a fun kind of sci-fi space, but also kind of extraterrestrial um, book. And so if anybody's looking for something to read, it came out a couple of years ago. I really, really uh, like it. I have actually cool. read it and I remember enjoying mm-hmm. it, but I forget the plot. Give me the 10, <laughs> ten word summary. Trigger my memory. Um, I'm going to give you a summary that's going to trigger your memory and try not to give things away okay. to others. Guy wakes up on a spaceship and makes friends with a spider alien. Ah, right. I thought, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Yes. Good. Jeez. Yeah, it's very good. So I heard him at ASM in Houston this summer. He was interviewed by Kate Rubens on stage for an event. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was fun to hear Excellent. the, cool. the two of That's them fun. up there. Yeah. And she was asking him questions and uh he would say i'm not a microbiologist ask them out there (laughs) (laughs) it was pretty funny he said basically nothing matters about truth or fact when he writes he just makes it up it is Uh, fiction yeah yeah there there was one part where i had to think and i was like okay here's a hypothesis of how that could be real (laughs) sure we'll go with that okay (laughs) rich what do you have for us okay my pick is my new squirrel feeder (laughs) <laughs> Actually, it was intended to be a bird feeder. It's called Bird Buddy. Okay, uh, but the uh, it is it is. I'll, I'll get into its actual features, but I have to say that its design is absolutely ideal for squirrels because they can get right <laughs> up on it and sit on it and just and they go through a whole feeder through of stuff every day. I haven't been able to get around them yet, but I'm going to go to I'm going to go to Wild Birds Unlimited and get my actually best. Uh, uh, possible squirrel defense mechanisms because I like this machine. It's it's a feeder that has a camera in it that's activated by the birds that land. Okay, and yeah. it's uh, connected Cute. with the internet, so you get little messages on your phone that tells you that somebody's been visiting your feeder, and you can click on it, and it identifies the birds or the squirrels for that. The matter. squirrels uh, and um, uh, has a little video. Uh, and stills that it makes and you can save them or put them away and uh it's just uh very entertaining how are you gonna can it keep- distinguish individuals within a species <laughs> uh no doesn't do oh, that okay. and in fact it has uh it doesn't get the species right all the time i don't think okay how does how do you keep the squirrels out? You put some some big pan underneath oh, or something. You know, uh, so far the only thing you I've, don't. I've got yeah, you don't. <laughs> it reminds me of that uh, wonderful video of the guy who set up uh, the uh, sort of squirrel obstacle course in his backyard. Okay? I think <laughs> yes. we picked that some time ago. At any rate, um, uh, I have this thing hanging. All right. And there's a you can there's an umbrella like thing uh-huh. you can hang over it and I've tried that in three different positions but the squirrel just says <laughs> uh, and goes down to the feeder. I, I, oh boy, a game. I'm gonna go. Yeah, fun game. Yeah, thank you very much. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go. I have a feeling that the better way to do this is to put it on a pole and uh, and get with a big funnel yeah, underneath it type yeah, of thing yeah, and maybe yeah. some landmines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think they're going to crawl up the pole. And yeah, well, crawl you know, under yeah, the they thing, will. You know, yeah. but so if so, not, what I do, they'll jump from the roof. <laughs> in a way, I don't really care. I don't mind feeding the squirrels. Okay, but they go through so much food. Well, okay? there's only one kind of squirrel. Cool. You, you want to yeah. look at different kinds of birds, yeah, right? That's right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, it's a good idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. And I you know I'm getting a lot out of it. I enjoy it. Do you get notification on your phone when when something's yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. And how I often can be, do you and I can be. How often oh, do you several look times at, a day. Yeah. Several times a day cuz uh, you know, uh as long as there's food in it, uh it, despite the squirrels, the birds are in and out all the time. It's, it's perfect for birds too. Cuz they can stand on this little shelf right in front of the camera and do their thing. You know, uh watching cardinals break open sunflower seeds and get out what's inside is uh, really pretty cool. Um, I'll bet you they wish they had thumbs, but they don't know about it, okay? <laughs> um, uh, and they're really pretty good with their beaks and their tongues doing is, all this. Isn't it the case that if you put pepper in the bird feed, the squirrels won't eat it? I've tried that. Doesn't work? No, I have. Uh, I have uh, Texas squirrels. Uh, Texas squirrels, <laughs> and they think they say, "Oh, tacos! This is great." It, it doesn't work with New England squirrels either. It just, uh, yeah, right. Okay, very good, Alan. What do you have for us? I have a pair of books um, that I read 
a little while ago uh, by uh, journalist Jason Schreier, who covers the um, the video game industry. And um, he's done two books about it, uh, Blood, Sweat, and Pixels and Press Reset. Um, and I, I really think of them as kind of a matched set. Uh, the first book is d- profiles of the development process of different major video games and how different game studios ranging from um, huge operations with, you know, hundreds of employees putting together some massive AAA release to um, actually one game that was developed over a period of about a decade by one guy who just, Mm. you know, obsessed over it and really ended up being very successful with it. Um, and, And it's just fascinating that because I, I mean I play video games and I often kind of wonder like well, where do these come from what's the process I, I understand more a lot more about the movie industry than I do about the video game industry and the video game industry is ridiculously secretive unnecessarily secretive about their methods <laughs> so it's really cool to get that kind of a, a perspective and then the second book press reset is about um, game studios that have closed, that have been shut down. So projects that have failed. There's uh, In the first book, there's one project that didn't make it to release. It's kind of an interesting story. The second book is all about the ways in which the industry screws up. And it is just... It is a jaw-dropping view of mismanagement and corporate malfeasance that is just a ripping good read to not have been part of, you know, <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> um, and, and fascinating to see how how the dysfunction develops in an industry like in, in that particular industry and why the particular problems it has are unique to the process of video game development. Just mm. really, really interesting stuff. It's a tough, cool. in, tough industry. Yeah. I'll bet. Yeah. That sounds like, those sound like books I would like to read. They're, they're very interesting. Uh, my pick is an article in the proceedings of the national Academy of sciences. So this is open access. I checked. So I'm now, sensitive yep. to this so you can read it. it's written by carolyn beans a science writer so you know pnas has uh, research articles and uh, features like this which are written by science writers like alan dove right and uh, i have not worked for pnas yet but i would same idea though give you, me a call guys you know, they commission people to write on or maybe yeah. people pitch yeah. the topic right anyway this is our microplastics spreading infectious disease so it's all about the plastosphere <laughs> So we use a lot of plastics, we throw them away, and over many, many years, they grind up into tiny fragments, and the definition is less than five millimeters, and it's a microplastic. There are between 82 and 358 trillion pieces of floating around in the oceans of Earth. They are coated with uh, bacteria, parasites, fungi, and viruses, and they're carrying around the world. And so this article tries to get into whether that's a problem uh, or not. And there's no proof that they are, but um, we should be thinking about it probably. As someone says here in the article, we're not going to stop this, but we should be aware of the risk. And they're going to be around for thousands of years. Yeah, they will probably outdo us. Oh, yeah, these microplastics will be drifting around when we're long past pushing up daisies. Man, we're really trashing the place, you know. Yeah. Well, I I saw a video on YouTube the other day by this guy who's into uh, uh, extraplanetary life, and he said, humanity has a few hundred years to go, and that's it. Then we're done. Wow. That's that's not very long. It's a dark view. We have two two listener picks. Uh, Tom sends us an article... Uh, about the uh, settlement uh, by Thermo Fisher with the family of Henrietta Lacks. I almost picked an article about this, but I saw this was in here. This is uh, in many different places, but uh, as you know, in the 50s, uh, Henrietta Lacks had a cervical tumor, which she eventually died of, but they removed some of her tissues. And from that came HeLa cells, which live on to this day and many people use and many companies uh, make money on. So they have reached an agreement uh, with um, 
family, the nature of which isn't disclosed. But uh, of course, this whole business was not known until uh, Rebecca Sklut's book it wasn't widely known. I would say but many people knew it. I knew that this, the cells came from her and that they didn't tell her about it nor her family. But um, uh, the, the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, the book and the movie uh, all made this widely known. And so um, there you go. Cool. Excellent. And, and cancel. So, yeah. And I think a second company actually got sued yesterday. Oh, yeah. Um, about her cells. Okay. Hmm. Uh, Kathleen sends us a pic of the week, Quantum Magazine, In why insect memories may not survive metamorphosis. Um, the reshuffling of neurons during fruit fly metamorphosis suggests that larval memories don't persist in adults. Uh, by Yasmin Saplakoglu. You know, it's very interesting. Um, this often happens. The URL of the article is insect brains melt and rewire during metamorphosis. <laughs> but yes, uh, so they probably made that first and and then made the title later. I don't know. But anyway, this is it's a cool article. Thank you very much for that. Uh, very good. Kathleen, I claim Kathleen writes, I claim perfect TWIV listener status or maybe extra perfect with listener status on three counts. I listen with pleasure to all the microbe TV podcasts. I believe I'm a member of a target audience, the non-scientist. I'm an artist. I am even happy not to not understand what you all are talking about at times because I find the calm drone of your voices <laughs> comforting. Oh my gosh, we're droning? Do we drone? The calm drone of our voices. <laughs> we'll take that as a compliment. Sure. In this, in, in this increasingly yeah. terrifying world, I rely on TWIV to give me a second home where grace under pressure is the norm and humans never lose their heads or their cool. Keep up the good work. We depend on it. I even keep my cool when there are squirrels in my bird feeder. <laughs> <laughs> grace under pressure is the norm. I like that very much. I think that could be a T-shirt. Twiv, grace under pressure is kind of like <laughs> countering like countering a miasma of anti think. Thank you, Kathleen. We appreciate it. We love yeah. getting uh, letters like this, folks. We're yeah. very happy to send them. We don't mind being called droning if you say nice things. <laughs> as long as we're calm drones. Calm and not drones, yes. I'd like to uh, stressful drones. Uh, I'd like to understand. Maybe I ought to read this article. Understand the details of metamorphosis because you know i've seen descriptions where basically inside you awaken from a terrible dream <laughs> and well, no no sorry no, well go ahead uh, uh, actually this says that when they wake up they don't remember what happened don't remember which is anything. probably a good thing because yeah. my understanding is that what <laughs> happens is pretty dramatic uh, certainly, when you look at what goes in and what comes out, it's dramatic. But I understand in between, there's some significant, really, dissociation and reassociation that goes on. But I don't understand the details. I read a short story by a Japanese author about a a, a bug that woke up as a human. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's more terrifying like the than the other way around. And he yeah. couldn't figure things out at all. He couldn't <laughs> figure it out. He was very confused. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's Twiv 1035. Oh, I said 1035. Look at that. You can yeah. find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Twiv. You can send us questions, comments, picks of the week to Twiv at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy our work and our droning voices, you can support us. We'd love your support. We need it. Our, our support is steadily declining, folks. Steadily, steadily. So, so you know, for a dollar a month, you could go to Patreon. Or PayPal, that would help because we have a lot of you out there. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Today on TWIV, we have Rich Condit, who is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, and currently in Austin, Texas, where it's really hot. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com and also alandove.com. And uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Brian Barker is at Drew University, bioprof Barker on. Twitter, X, whatever it is. Thank you, Brianne. On all the social, all the Are social. Are you on medias. Threads? Oh. Or Thread? Uh, I think I, I downloaded it and I opened it once. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, but thanks. It was I learned a lot. <laughs> Threads is interesting. Uh, you know, it came out of Instagram. And mm -hmm. it was a way for the company employees to communicate. So they decided to make it an app. It's it's kind of like a Twitter thing. And it got huge, over 200 million in days, more the biggest rollout ever of an app. And um, I mean, it's, it's just another place to be. Uh, yesterday, I uh, so when someone follows you, you automatically follow them back. That's the way it works instead of you having to do it. So yesterday... I followed Rebecca Sklute, who, as we just saw, was uh, mentioned in that story. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at all the social media platforms. Yeah, Microbe TV is on all of them. We're even on TikTok. Ooh. And Jessica, a Cornell, I'm sorry. a Cornell grad, is uh, making TikToks for us over there. Uh, but I'm Vincent Racanello. You can go to my blog, virology.ws. I always say that, but I'm really not there any. I don't write there anymore. Maybe better <laughs> to say I'm at microbe.tv because that's uh, where I am publishing. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Jolene for the timestamps, and Ronald Jenkins for the music. Jolene, you hear at the end of every TWIV, right? She's actually going to be on TWIV in a couple of weeks. I had lunch with Jolene oh, just cool. the other day. That's who that is on the schedule. Yes, yeah, JRR. Um, yeah, I was I was looking at that. It was like, what? Is that one of Vincent's kids? <laughs> no, uh, no. Tolkien? No. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I saw Jolene at um, ASM in Houston. And I said, why don't you come on? Tell us about your work. She's in yeah. a lab. She works nice. on phages. She does cool stuff. I heard her talk. She was really good. So... Uh, Jolene, yeah, she'll be. So you get to hear the person who does the timestamps. Cool. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>